This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 19 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Latini Creative Solutions. They have over 20 years of experience in design, print, and marketing, specializing in creative solutions that capture your voice and deliver your message. And they have been instrumental in the building of the Mistress Carrie podcast, Cocktails in the War Room, my new website that is under construction, and very soon, the official Mistress Carrie online store. So from supporting and energizing your already established brand to developing your company's identity and marketing campaigns, Latina Creative Solutions provides design that is thoughtful, focused, and creatively executed. And if they can do it for me, they can do it for you. Find out more at latinicreative.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by the Maine Hair Lounge. And when I say Maine, I mean M-A-N-E, as in your hair. I get asked constantly, Who does your hair? What's the name of the color? How can I get my hair like that? You've been dyeing your hair purple for so long. Why is it not all dead and falling out of your head? Can I touch it? It's so soft. It goes on and on. And the answer to all of those questions is Linda at the main hair lounge in Framingham. She's been doing my hair for over 15 years. And whether you want to cover up the grays, get a new haircut for a job interview, get an updo for a wedding, getting some professional photographs taken, or pretty much any other excuse why you need your hair to be awesome, Linda can take care of it. And yes, she cuts men's hair too. If you want your hair to rock, go see Linda at the Maine Hair Lounge. Find her online at mainehairlounge.com. Don't forget, M-A-N-E hairlounge.com. Before we get to this week's episode, I want to send out a special hello and thank you to Noelle, Betty, and Chris, the latest recipients of the Mistress Carrie Backstage Pass. You can get your Backstage Pass at Patreon right now. Just log on to patreon.com slash Mistress Carrie. What's the Backstage Pass, you ask? Well, we're building a whole community, a fan club. A group of people that I can bounce ideas off of and people that I can share exclusive photographs, polls, blog posts, and all kinds of details about what's going on behind the scenes here at the Mistress Carrie podcast, behind the scenes at Cocktails in the War Room, and of course, all of Wednesday the Goth Pug's Adventures in My Garden. It's also a place where you'll be able to get discounted merchandise when my new online store launches, which is coming very soon. So if you want more Mistress Carrie in your life, and let's be honest, how could you not? Log on to patreon.com slash Mistress Carrie and get yourself a Mistress Carrie backstage pass. And by the way, a backstage pass makes an awesome gift. Okay, this week, someone I have known for years. Kevin Martin has been the lead singer of Candlebox, well, since the band started. I've known him since before I started on the air at WAF. I think we met when I was still an intern, and we've always kept in touch. The last time I actually saw him was a couple days after I ran the Boston Marathon in 2019. But we got a chance to catch up, and we talked about everything. We talked about the band and the new Candlebox song, Let Me Down Easy, that came out at the end of August. We talked about how he's been handling the lockdown with COVID. And even went way back to the early and mid-90s when I first met the band and some great stories 
what it was like to tour with Rush. We talked a little bit about politics. And by the way, this episode was recorded the day that Eddie Van Halen died. But the news hadn't broken when he and I stopped talking. Obviously, once everyone found out about Eddie Van Halen, Kevin Martin and I had to reconnect. Because how could we have a conversation about rock and roll and not talk about Eddie Van Halen's legacy? So this podcast is in two pieces. Our conversation before the Eddie Van Halen news broke and our conversation after. And his story about golfing with Eddie Van Halen is amazing. I love this episode and I hope you love it too. Allow me to introduce you to Kevin Martin from Candlebox. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely. Good eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stain, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. This is Marilyn Manson, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to... You have the privilege of listening to Mistress Carrie. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Take a sip of your coffee. I'll join you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kevin Martin, how are you? I'm uh, I'm alive and well and healthy and I got no complaints, thank God. Yeah, 2020 has been a little, a little fun, hasn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's been a really amazing year. I don't know why everybody's complaining because it's just amazingly brilliant. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's nutty, man. It's a uh, it's strange times. I'm I should be on the on the road right now. I should be on tour. So. The last time I saw you, uh, you were in the WAF studio in Boston the day after I ran the Boston Marathon last year. Yeah, yep. And a little over a year later, the marathon gets canceled. WAF goes off the air. You can't tour. And now where I'm locked into Welcome to MCHQ, my new studio, where are you right now? Uh, I'm at uh, my, I bought a vacation home in Palm Springs um, that I do Airbnb at. Um, and then I come out here when there's nobody here. So I'm, I'm out here actually with Adam, my bass player and, uh, my buddy David, and we're just kind of jamming some tunes and hanging out and relaxing for a couple of days. So I love those, uh, uh beams behind you in the ceiling. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I love the stories of how the bands are starting to quarantine together because the idea of just not creating <clears throat> new music is not an option for you guys. And for a while, it just seemed like no one was going to release any new music and that everything was just frozen. And a lot of artists have chosen not to release new music, but um, you guys did. Well, we put a song out. I mean, the record was supposed to come out um, in August. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was, you know, really just to kind of appease the fans or, you know, to give them something. Um, you know, they, they helped fundraise the record for us. They paid for it. Um, and we just, we felt bad that we didn't have anything, you know? Um, so we're like, well, the record's going to come out next spring. So let's start doing that kind of Apple music thing where you release one song and then in, you know, another month and a half we'll release another one. So by the time you get the record in, whether it's, you know, January, February or March, you've got at least three or four pieces that you've been listening to. So you're hopefully excited about the record. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's strange times indeed. I mean, I don't think, I don't think anybody had any idea that something like this was coming, you know, um, to, to shut down an entire world, you know, that not just the United States. I mean, you know, look what happened in Italy and, and France. I mean, it's just, uh, it's crazy. You know, I, uh, I never in my, in my lifetime would have thought something, you know, like this would have happened, but apparently every hundred years, some sort of plague comes along. So, 
it's go. it's it's uh, a joke that I've said many times on the podcast. Uh, so I apologize to everyone who has listened to every episode and heard this joke multiple times. But the joke has been WAF going off the air in February triggered the apocalypse and started the dominoes falling at the end of the world. So I would just like to apologize to you because the radio station got sold and that's what started all this shit. It's that, it's that, that's the fault. That's really the fault. Yeah. Yeah. And if we could Uh, just get some money back together to put AAF back on the air, it'll all stop. Yeah. Just, it's, (laughs) you know, it's, I mean, that's the history of that station. I I was shocked when, when they, uh, when they told me that it was going off the air. I was like, what do you, that's not possible. This how was does, our 50th anniversary year this year. How does a rock and roll station in a rock and roll town get taken off the air? I, it was shocking to me, you know. Ten and, and a half sorry. million dollars, that's how. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. It's so that's, that's why I'm so um, passionate about what I'm doing now because I'm able now to do all the things that I did at WAF, but do it in my own way. Yeah. And I can say fuck, which yeah. is weird because I couldn't do that for 29 years. <laughs> and um, and I'm really trying to keep this amazing rock scene together in New England because there isn't an outlet for new rock music in Boston for the yeah. first time in over 50 years. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So the fact that there's so many artists like yourself that have been so supportive of all of my new endeavors and... Uh, you know, it's going really well. And there's obviously a rock audience up here. You know that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, New England for the longest time, Boston um, was our number one market, you know, for, I think it was close to 12 years when we started back in 1993, Boston was our our number one market. Um, I know every time we go through, through Boston, New England area, you know, Connecticut, whatever, the shows are always full of, rock and roll fans, you know, and that's, that's, a, you know, it's a dying breed, sad to say, and, and unfortunately, but, um, the, the more these stations that get taken off the air, the more fans we're losing to, you know, to hip hop or, you know, pop music or whatever. Um, it's just, it's strange to me. I mean, you know, this whole machine gun Kelly thing, so weird to me, um, cause he was a rapper and now he's blink 182. You know, um, it just shows you how much getting into Tommy (laughs) Lee's skin will change a man, right? Yeah. You know, it's so, it's, it's really beyond me that, that this guy, it's not that he's not talented because I'm sure he is. I just, I'm like, how, how do you go from that to this? I mean, I get it. Travis Barker has a ton to do with it, but if that, is that the future of rock and roll, you know? I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody knows what it is. I just have to have faith in watching Dave Grohl drum battle a 10-year-old girl on the internet and say, yeah. rock isn't going to die if there's girls like Nandy. You know? That's true. Yeah. But she still listens to pop music. Right. <laughs> but I think I think in our grandparents and our parents' generations – we weren't so focused on an album and you were allowed, like I remember being in high school, you wore the concert shirt or the band you loved and it defined who you were, what you thought, who you could be friends with. Yeah. And music is more broad than that. I think, I think we've learned that you can have Taylor Swift and mm-hmm. Miley Cyrus in your music collection, but then also love you know, old Pantera records. I mean, it is possible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, listen, I do that. I mean, if you look through my, my Apple account, you'd, you'd laugh your ass off. What's in there? Uh, Come on. Guilty uh, pleasure, Kevin. Uh, Give me some good ones. I mean, I, I just, I've been listening to a lot of yacht rock lately. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, so, I mean, Haim, do you know Haim? The three yeah. girls from yeah. one of my favorite bands, their new record's amazing. Um, um, actually I've been listening to a lot of Bob Schneider, which is kind of, I don't know if you remember him. Um, Taylor Swift's new record, Folklore, right there. Um, uh, Hamilton Lighthouser. I mean, it's Neon Trees. I think they're great. Death in Vegas. Yeah, they're a great you know, band. I'm, I'm kind of all over the place and there's the Candlebox record. Wolves, which is coming out next year. Oh, look, my Ramones right next to your t-shirt there. So. See, there you go. 
but I'm, I'm really, I'm kind of all over the place. You know, I, I, I can appreciate great pop music and, um, and, uh, you know, I just, I really wish that there was some sort of answer to what's happening to, to rock and roll and, and the community of rock and roll and the fans. And it's, it's just like when you go to Europe, like we toured Europe last year, last summer, we had stupidly missed out on some tours back in the nineties, but we still go over there and play to like 50 people. You know, it's like, just because there are 50 faces you've never seen before. I tour the United States, you know, I'll play Louisville one night, the next night in Ohio, I'll see seven of the, you know, people from the last night's show. They'll travel and they'll, which I'm, you know, I'm grateful for. They'll come and see us, you know, what, 10 times on, on one run. So it's really nice when you go to Europe and you, you're only playing for 50 people in Scotland, but you don't know any of those faces and they're there to see you because they love your band. They know every word, they're singing every word, they're going nuts for you, and there's only 50 of them in the room. You know, that's, Americans have kind of lost that, I think, love for concerts. And because we're so used to having things, you know, the ease of a phone or the ease of a convenience store, you know, at two in the morning or three in the morning, you don't have that type of stuff in Europe. And and in South America, so these people, music is still what it was to you and I in the, you know, in the 70s and the 80s when we were, you know, young kids figuring out these are our favorite bands and I've got to look at this record. I've got to, you know, go through the whole catalog of what's happening on this album, all the lyrics, you know, that nobody does that anymore. And, and I, it's, it's just sad that that's kind of what's happening to rock and roll. I really wish... Um, that there was some sort of magic answer or some kind of potion that brought everybody back to remember, listen, maybe this is what it is. Next year when bands are touring, people are going to be going fucking nuts for concerts. So, <laughs> I mean, it might be the greatest year in touring history, you know, for every band ever, 2021. This year was supposed to be a yeah. massive year. I mean, literally every band was supposed to go out on the road this year, yeah. no matter yeah. how long they've been out, if they're your new band or a 50 year old heritage <clears throat> act. This yeah. year was supposed to be the biggest rock touring year, I believe, in history. Yeah. And everything just got paused until 2021. 2021, because of- yeah, because of COVID. And, and 2021, if we can get a handle on this virus in a way where people feel comfortable going into arenas and tours can get insured, yeah, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, it's going to be nuts. I'm... You know, I'm kicking around ideas of bands to tour with, you know, because it's, I want to do something, I want to do something special next. We were actually supposed to be out with Three Doors Down uh, in August and September of this year, celebrating their 20th anniversary of their first record. Uh, So that's going to continue next year. So we'll be doing that with them next year, which I'm excited about. Um, I love those guys. Uh, Been playing shows with them, you know, forever. Um, So I've got that to look forward to, but- Brad Arnold was on the podcast last week. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I was going to ask you about them because um, they have a very kind of similar story in that Three Doors Down came out, Kryptonite came out, and the band became huge seemingly overnight. Yeah. And when Candlebox's first record came out, you guys just took off. Mm-hmm. And that that adjustment from being a brand new band that only, you know, the local fans in the Seattle area knew to getting played on every rock station around the country seemingly overnight. I, there yeah. aren't that many bands that had that kind of skyrocketing success off their debut. No, and, it, you know, it, and it's it totally attributed to, you know, us coming out of Seattle and, you know, when all eyes are on a city, from 19, you know, 86 to 1994, you know, uh, it, I think all my friends got signed. You know, every one of my friends' bands got signed. Uh, not, not all of them had the success that we had. But for us, you know, it, it was the fact that we came off of this, you know, I guess, um, vote voter card, if you will, for what's happening with rock and roll in Seattle. You know, oh, there's a band called Candlebox as well. Oh, well, let's listen to them. And we happen to be like an arena rock type of band. I always kind of compare us to, you know, the journey of, of the nineties. You know, we, we 
we wrote these big kind of ballads and big rock songs and but we were kind of the 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 weird looking kids from the city we didn't you know we weren't the grungy dudes that were in a punk band um you know or wearing you know shorts with long johns on underneath them and, and doc martens you know so we were more the clean cut guys um and i think that that was kind of because of of what we had written with far behind and you and cover me those types of songs being more accessible uh to a listener's ear because nirvana and pearl jam and soundgarden and alice in chains had come before us kind of set things up it made it very easy for us and and i think that that was that worked against us a lot as well with other bands you know um you know i some of the bands that we toured with the flaming lips you know they've they've not shied away from you know talking you know poorly about us even though we toured together um in interviews and books and stuff because they just weren't fans. And, you know, um, we happen to like them a lot, but they weren't really fans of ours. You know, that happens. Um, and it, and it had a lot to do with the fact that our, the success for Candlebox was so rapid, um, that I think everybody just thought we were kind of like a boy band. Um, and three doors down, you know, I think the nice thing about them and, the, and their, you know, what's so good about them and their story is that they weren't, you know, following in the footsteps of some other band from their town. You know, they, they wrote a great record. They, the uh, kryptonite was um, so incredibly addictive. It was very similar to collective soul with um, shine shine. Yep. That song? I mean, yep. it, you, as much as you didn't want to listen to it, it came on, you listened to it, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I, that's one of the reasons I love them so much. I love playing shows with them because every single song they play is a hit. You know, I mean, and they're not Nickelback. They're three doors down. You know, they, they write great songs. They write great records. Brad's new single that he did with Greg is, you know, it's rad. You know, it's Wicked Man. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. And, and you know, there's, and they're Republicans, which, you know, I'm like, I'm not a Republican. I don't have their views, but, you know, they're staunch Republicans. They fully support Trump. That's their, that's their base. They don't shy away from it. And, you know, you got to respect that. You got to respect that with a band that, that will put themselves out there like that and say, well, you know, this is how we feel. You know, it's it's and they write great songs, you know, about those types of things. So, you know, I, I, I'm I respect the shit out of them. And they're they're one of those bands that, you know, when you when you start diving into politics, I mean, Brad and I had a very candid conversation about his sobriety mm -hmm. and he yeah. attributes so much of the success of his sobriety to his spirituality and his God, which he talks freely about. And so I think that for him, it's, it's, he's very accepting of everyone, but he just knows what works for him. Yeah. But yeah. he's such a nice guy. And those band that, that band, all those members are just so nice. Yeah. That yeah, they're great guys. You, you, you can have in 2020, uh, differences of opinion and still respect each other. And obviously that is something that is incredibly difficult for more and more people to understand. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, here in Massachusetts, you know, the Speaker of the House was Tip O'Neill and him and yeah. Reagan used to be able to sit down and have a beer and be completely on opposite sides of a, a political debate. I mean, look at Antonin Scalia and, and yeah. Notorious RBG. Yeah. They couldn't have been more diametrically opposed in their beliefs, but found common ground. And we're like, you know what? We're just going to be respectful of each other. Yeah. And I think when you find people like that, you have to respect them. Yeah. Even if you don't agree with them because they're respecting you and the fact that they don't agree with you. Yeah. And if we could get more people to understand that concept, it would be a hell of a lot easier to solve problems. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my opinion of, of the current office, you know, is not good and it's negative. And I have so many times allowed it to get under my skin. And I think that's the thing that's most frustrating for me is, you know, I was, I'm a kid of the Reagan era, you know, as were you, we were kids when he was president. I remember my father losing his mind that we elected an actor as president. Um, it's, it's, it's just so strange to me that this television personality is who's running our country and there's so much, um, blind support. It's, it's, 
it's boggling my mind. But I have to respect their opinions of him. The problem is, is it's become so volatile, the relationship between his supporters and those that don't support him, that I don't know if it's ever going to be fixable. You know, I, I don't know what we're looking at long term with the negative um, sides of this whole past four years. I mean, I just don't know. I, I It feels I've, like we're on the on the, the precipice of another civil war. I mean, it's I've, that it's, it's I've that never scary. Seen this. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it yeah. really it's it's shocking to me. And and it's like that's not, you know, that's not great to me. You know, it's not great to me. And I, and I, and I, I don't understand that, but again, you know, to each his own. And my opinion is, is just my opinion. You know, it's, it, it doesn't make it right. Um, but, you know, I have had those moments where it gets crawling under my skin and I, you know, I go on the, the Twitters and the Instagrams and, you know, but, and I have to say, you know, people that come attack me, you know, for, for, you know, why don't you just stick to singing? It's like, listen, I'm, I have the same kind of fucking job you do. It, it's it, this is my job, you know. It, it, at least allow me the freedom to to voice my opinion about, you know, my political affiliation. Or, well, what's or, funny is they're supporting someone who was a television personality that spouted yeah. his opinion about politics. Yeah. Nobody told him to shut up and dribble. Exactly. You know. Yeah. And it's it's like we all have a vote. Yeah. I think the the biggest problem that I see is, you know, neither one of the, the political parties wants me as a member because no. I don't fit into either platform. And the only way I see through it is someone that is charismatic and more in the middle with common sense that actually can launch a third party candidacy yeah. that knocks both of the established parties in the United States on their ass. The only person that I can see that could pull it off as ridiculous as this is going to sound coming out of my mouth is the rock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the only person that I can think of that is so well loved. Yeah. Who has views on both sides. Yeah. Who is an entrepreneur and came from nothing and everything he has, he earned. And you can't really, like, nobody hates the guy. <laughs> He's no. the only, I'm hanging my hopes of the United States on the rock running for president, Kevin. I'm, I'm backing you on that. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's crazy that this is the only country in the world that doesn't have a, you know, three, three party system, you know, um, well, that's of our size. It doesn't have a three party system. You know? Right. I, my wife's Australian. They have it there. Um, you know, England, you know, these, these countries that we're allies with have it. There's a reason for it. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really bizarre that we are a democratic Republic and that's all we are. And I, you know, if you did have somebody like the rock come along or, you know, that's that, that like you said, that well-loved, you have, and that's already gone an through the scrutiny. There's no yeah. skeletons in his closet because if they yeah. were, they would already have been found with his level of fame. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, wow, it's just, wow, wow. it's it's totally crazy. And I I am in a hundred percent agreement with you that, especially being locked in the house this year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for a while in the early stages of COVID, I was glued to the news because I just wanted to know what the fuck was going on. Yeah. And I would get so mad and it's like, what are you going to do? Like you, what do you, you can't leave the house. Yeah. So you're pissed, but yeah. you can do nothing about it. So it's kind of like you, you have to find this inner peace in yourself to just go, I'm going to control what I can control and just be as good of a person as I can be. Yeah. And that's got to help you sleep, I guess. Right. Well, you hope, I mean, you hope it does. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've just got, I really want this year to be over. <laughs> you I and me want both. It to be over. I want to figure out what I'm doing next year and I want to get my record out. You know, like I just, yeah. I, I'm so 
upside down of what's been happening in it this year. And, and, uh, and that frustration is exactly what I've had sitting at home going, I can't do anything. You know, when can I do something? Uh, and, and, and yeah, I mean, here we are. What's hopefully the last the rock, concert that rock you were at? Yeah, exactly. I'm hanging my hopes on that too. What was your last <laughs> show that you played? Uh, our last show was in Florida. We did two nights in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And when and was that? February 29th. We flew home on the 1st. Uh, and then we were supposed to go back out uh, in March um, for another two weeks. So we were headed to Nashville on the 14th for three days of rehearsals. And then we were going out. Um, so, yeah, the last the last show I've been to or I played was um, basically March 29th. Or uh, February 29th, oh, rather. Yeah. That meets, I saw Bush in Vegas on yeah. February 28th. Yeah. And I, I, I've I, made the joke that I, I should have had one more beer. Like, <laughs> I should have sang a little louder. I should have, you know what I mean? Because, like, if I had known that was going to be the last show that I went to the whole year, like, I would have yeah. savored it a little more. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. I, I think you're not alone in that with, uh, with music fans at all. You know, God, I really just wish I'd have you know been able to see one more, or you know, really enjoyed the show a little bit more than than I actually did, because I knowing that we weren't going to see anything for a year, you know. And it's strange to me now that people are actually going out and playing shows. You know, um, like in Oklahoma, a buddy of mine is a promoter there, and he's putting on shows, and I'm just, I can't, I mean, I can't get insurance, you know, for my band and guys, so it's like I can't go there and play. He's like, just come play a show. I said, dude, if I do that, first of all. Live Nation and AEG is going to kill me because I'll get blacklisted for going and playing shows at venues that they're basically the, the buyer of. And I'm not, I'm not insured. I mean, it's just, I can't do it. You know, um, I don't, I don't know, even know how Sully and Aaron Lewis are doing this thing, uh, the drive-in unless they're insuring themselves for it. But I mean, it's, and then again, why do you want to be 60 feet away from, these people in their cars, I don't know, man, I got to be in it. You know, I want to feel, I want to feel the sweat. I want to smell the audience. I want to, I want to taste the salt in the air, you know, of, of the energy of the show. There's no way I could go and sit down and, and I don't know, play in front of cars parked at a drive-in theater. I just couldn't do it. It's really strange. I mean, I, I talked to Shinedown's director of security um, because those guys had done some shows and, yeah. you know, he's a secret service agent. And so we were joking about the security protocols. I mean, obviously after like what happened with Dimebag Daryl and the whole rock and roll industry, security became so much more tight for every artist and real, a real focus as it should be for you guys. And then you go and you make concerts where people are driving multi-ton vehicles full of flammable gases into a concert and the the security questions that come up from that i mean that was one of the things he and i were discussing is like you don't have to check a vehicle's trunk for bombs yeah. or like whatever when you go into an arena you just get the pat down and you know they look through your purse and with girls they make sure you don't have joints in your tampons and you go into the show it's like yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. And uh, it just is so strange that, do you mind talking about the business side of it a little bit? Because one of the things that I like to do with this podcast is kind of get people to understand how the business works behind so that when they say like, well, why the fuck won't that band go out and tour? Yeah. Do you mind kind of going through the process of, okay, you decide that you and the guys from Candlebox are going to go out on tour? That's domino number one, that the band makes the decision to do it. Yeah. What happens between that decision and me calling you to get free tickets? Like at what point, <laughs> <laughs> at what, what dominoes fall in between so that people kind of get an idea of why it's so difficult for shows to get scheduled right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, first and foremost is your insurance. So you have to have work, workers comp insurance for everybody that's a part of your crew. Um, you have to have insurance for the vehicle that you're touring in. If it's a tour bus or a van or whatever the hell that is, it's a separate insurance that, you know, doesn't, you know, it's not your Geico insurance or something like that. Uh, then you have to have the actual tour insurance, which basically backs uh, the, your 
backs your guarantees. So it makes sure that if you show up, um, you know, that the promoter gets paid and you get paid. Um, you've got um, your agent who's dealing with every single venue, you know, in the country trying to make sure that there's a Wednesday for you or Thursday, or Friday, a Saturday, not a Monday or a Sunday. Um, but really, it's just the whole the whole business itself is a business. And, and you know, it's the, the joke is you know, it's called show business for a reason. It is a business that you as an artist can make the decision. Like when we decided to go to Europe, you know, we did a crowdfunder. We didn't have enough money to do it. So we did a crowdfunder. But then even then I had to use the majority of that crowdfunding money to pay the guys in the band, but also for the insurance to be in Europe. And then you've got visa costs, which you know you go there, play a show, you've got to pay a visa, which is 250 bucks or whatever it is per, for to be over there for a month. I mean, there's just, it's so financial. The, the, ex, the expense of touring is so high um, that it's, you know, it's difficult as, a, as an artist, you know, you want to go out and, and tour for eight months and play every single city that, that there, there is and everybody's town. But financially, it's just unless you're making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a night, um, it's really, really next to impossible. I mean, the struggle... That's why most of these bands are always touring. Seven Dust and whatnot. A lot of the rock bands are always on the road because that's the only way they're making money. If they come home to restart that engine, is exorbitantly expensive. You know, so once you're out there, you can keep you know you can keep the wheels on the bus. But when you come home, you take a break; those wheels can fall right off. And um, and financially, you're looking at you know just. Oh, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, every time I sit with my business manager to go over the numbers for a tour, I'm just like, oh my God, how, how am I doing this? You know, how am I even surviving this? You know, Because um, my guys are all hired guns. You know, I'm, I'm the only remaining member of Cannabox. So, um, you know, and out of a, out of a guarantee, um, I'm lucky if I'm touring at 18 to 20% net, you know, not 50 or 60%, you know, so it's, it's, um, <laughs> there've been times when it's been very slim you know, um, financially, uh, and, and especially doing Europe last year, like I, I came back, you know, about $17,000, um, in the red, you know, which is, I've got to make that up. Um, but my band, my band guys got paid and we all got to fly home and the bus was paid for and that, but, you know, I took a, I took a loss, but, you know, sometimes you have to do that in order to have those moments that, um, you know, that we all enjoy, which I said, you know, seeing, people's faces that you've never seen before or, or playing, you know, someplace in, um, in, uh, you know, uh, Denmark or, you know, something like that, uh, Belgium, you know, those, those things are, you know, those are once in a lifetime opportunities. So you, you, you're willing to take that hit sometimes, but. Um, Talk about the passion of those rock fans over there. A couple years ago, I went to Bucharest, Romania and saw Judas Priest and it was the craziest thing I had ever experienced. They were grandparents with little kids and it was in this parking lot in downtown Romania, in downtown Bucharest. And the rock fan, I mean, it took over the city of Bucharest the way that the Super Bowl takes over the host city in the United States. Yeah. Everybody had Judas Priest shirts on. You could tell everybody was going. It was crazy. I had never experienced rock music like that in a foreign country. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Like South, when we go to South America, when we go to Chile, um, Santiago, it's like the Beatles have come to town, and, and we're just like we're just Candlebox, you know, like you know. But their their whole thing is when they love a band, they love you, you know, beyond passionately. Um, it's 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 stunning to experience. And when we did this last year, when we were over in Europe and we played, um, in Belgium, um, this big rock festival, uh, and we were on the same bill as Slayer. I mean, it was insane. These people, their, their, their passion for rock and roll is unlike anything, you know, I, I don't think I've seen that kind of passion in, in America, you know, really since the nineties, that's kind of when I, when I last remember experiencing that kind of um, unbridled passion for rock and roll. Um, like even now when you go to Coachella or Lollapalooza in Chicago, the people in the front 
are there and they're crazy about it. There's, but that's like, you know, you're talking maybe the first thousand people. Everybody else is just kind of listening to the music, hanging out with their friends, you know, smoking a joint, whatever they're doing. Coachella here in, in, Las, in uh, um, Palm Springs. That first row, the, the you know, thousand people that are up there against the thing, or, you know, when Billie Eilish played last year, you know, everybody was going nuts trying to get to the stage. I mean, it wasn't really about going to be close to Billie Eilish. It was about just going over there because that's where everybody was going. And in Europe, it's like people are running across the field when Slayer's about to go on because they came from another stage that was, you know, way over there. They're, you know, and it's thousands of people you know, 10, 15,000 people running to get to see Slayer play. It's the same in South America. It's, um, it's crazy passion. Uh, and, and, uh, you like the t-shirt thing, everybody, everybody was buying t-shirts. I mean, they'd have like, they put, they buy one, put it on, see the band, buy another one, put it on. Like it's, it's, it's mayhem over there. And it's really beautiful because they're so crazy about their love for these bands. And um, I mean, they're, you know, I, I wish that, I wish we hadn't lost that passion here in the United States. Like I said, I think that the cell phones have given us so much instant gratification that we're forgetting what's you know, the beauty that's around us to take a look at it. And, and music is one of those things, you know, be, the fact that it's being cut out of school programs is the most disturbing thing ever, because that's where I learned to play music. That's where I learned to be a musician. Um, and that's just, it's going away. It's, it's, it's uh, the arts are being cut out of you know, school programs and all that sort of thing. It just bothers me because that's the last thing you want to take away from children is their art, their freedom of expression musically. Certainly. Well, it exercises the same part of your brain as mathematics and language does. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you want that muscle in your brain to be strong, you exercise it with music. That's yeah. the science behind it. And what, what rock and roll made you go, that's it for me. That's what I want. That's what, what band was it? Was it a song? I mean, when you were growing up, what was it that made you love and fall in love with rock? Oh, kiss. Yeah. 100%. I mean, I was five, four or five years old when my brother, Dennis, who's 10 years older than me brought home kiss alive too, or I can't remember which trick it was. I mean, I was just like, what is this? And of course, the, you know, the makeup and, and uh, they're, you know, all my Halloween pictures from the age of five to, you know, to 12 are kiss makeup, you know. Um, I chose one for my confirmation name, my Catholic confirmation name, uh, Paul, because of Paul Stanley, you know, I mean, because <laughs> you had to have Jesus a, approved. <laughs> you know, but seriously, like, I mean, that's how much I loved kiss. And then, of course, as I got older, I you know fell in love with the Clash and like punk rock was really kind of became my thing. Um, but I've always, always to this day, been like Kiss. It Kiss was it for me, you know. I mean, I just seeing them and and that influence on me <clears throat> as a young child um, really is what kind of put me in the direction of maybe I want to do music, you know, maybe I want to be a rock and roll star. Um, but I, you know, initially it was just a drummer. That, that was kind of what I was doing. And then I got asked to sing on these demos with, you know, with the, uh, an old friend of mine, Rick Vaughn, who was our original guitar player. And then we became Candlebox after that. So I got stuck with the job. But um, yeah, I mean. I'm, I feel so bad for you. Stuck <laughs> well, with the job of. Uh, it's you know that it's not you can easy actually to... sing like it, it that story like you look at a guy like Sully or Steven Tyler, mm -hmm. Don Henley. I mean, there are a lot of people that started out behind the drum kit, and then it was like, Chris oh Cornell. wait, I'm yeah, exactly. I might yeah. be able to sing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a uh, listen. I'm the reluctant lead singer. It's a great job, but I would much rather be playing drums. Do you still play? Yeah, yeah. Sound checks and stuff like that. I don't have a kid at my house, but. um that I'm might not. help you with all that political <laughs> angst. Dive behind the kit and just beat the shit out of it for a while. Yeah, I mean that's probably what I should be doing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, now I I, uh, I I do I I still love drums. I mean, my wife's like, why don't you just start a band and be the drummer? I'm like, I'm 51 years old. Why the <laughs> fuck would I start a band as a drummer now? You know, you think you think my back hurts now? Yeah, you know when I complain about it, Jesus, you know. But I do. I I I I think that. When you're taking away 
this gift that is given to us, you know, as, as musicians and, and people that love music, if you take it away from us at such an early age in school, you're really, you're just crushing so much of the opportunities that, that music grants you <clears throat> as you get older, whether it's becoming a musician or, you know, uh, working at a radio station or being a, a broker on Wall Street or something like that. Music is in everything we do all day long. And if, and if you can teach a, a child to play an instrument at a very young age, they take that with them forever, you know? And, uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm so kind of bummed out that it's, even with Save Our Music, you know, these programs that musicians are doing and trying to keep music in the schools, we got people like Betsy DeVos that are taking that away from them. And, you know, it, why, why remove the one thing that, that every child loves? I think, I don't know one kid who doesn't love music. You know, I, I have a friend who's got three daughters. I've known them each one since they were born. Uh, Lucia, Pilar, and Isabel, all three of them crazy for music all day long. I mean, it's like my son, Jasper, his playlist is amazing. I look at some of these songs he's picked. I'm like, how do you know these fucking bands? You know, but it's, <laughs> he goes on Spotify and he picks this artist and, and then he just goes and finds all these other, and he's 12 and he's digging, digging, digging. So I know that if he had music in his school, of course, right now he wouldn't be in there because we're locked out, we're locked out in LA, but if he had it in his school and he had that opportunity, not the recorder, like a real school band, he'd be in there, you know? And I know if he got behind a drum kit, it would be, that would be it for him as well. Like just same as it was for me. The minute I sat behind, behind a drum kit at the age of 10, my first was like, boom, boom, tap. I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be amazing. I cannot wait to do this. And, uh, and I looked forward to it every day. I also played saxophone, clarinet, French horn. I played boom. clarinet too. Yeah. In the school band. I sucked yeah. at it. Obviously didn't end up in a rock band. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you're not, what do you, who is it? Uh, is there, there's not really a rock band that has a clarinet player. <laughs> no, there's no heavy metal clarinet, <clears throat> which is, you know, I chose poorly. There's only and heavy metal flute, you know, with Jethro Tull and all that. Right. Well, I mean, it's officially heavy metal after the Grammy. Yeah, of course. That's but I wish too. that I had learned how to play like trumpet or something cool like that. I tried, I carried that stupid giant big bass drum around in the marching band for a while. You want to talk about back pain? <laughs> yeah. It's like a yeah, hundred pound high school girl carrying that giant bass drum around. Like I made really poor life choices <laughs> when it came to music. Oh man, that's fun. I, that's yeah. That's not something I ever uh, aspired to do. You know, when I was, when I actually, I didn't do marching band. I just did band in school, but um, I always felt bad for that kid who had to pick up that bass drum and walk it was out me. of the band room with it. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I mean, you know, what time they're the like tuba guy yeah they're like 55 inches i think right those bass drums are massive like the size yeah, of the they're tv huge. you know so yeah. yeah and if you turn wrong i mean everybody notices because you get this giant <laughs> drum on your chest yeah and where somebody so walks ridiculous. right into you yeah 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 well you talk about you know you talk about finding this music and this loyalty of these artists do you agree that rock fans are the most loyal, even in the United States, of any genre of music? Meaning, you can have a band like Candlebox that breaks out in the early 90s, and those fans still love you to this day and will always love you, whereas pop artists, they have a hit song, and then nine months later, or a year later, or two years later, people just don't even know who they are anymore. Yeah, they, well, they're branding on some other you know, project of a pair of shoes or something like that. Or makeup. Yeah. But no, I do. I think that country fans and rock fans um, are, are probably the two most loyal. Um, and I, you know, and I have to include country fans in there just because, you know, you, if you go back to, you know, the fifties and the sixties and some of these artists that um, were, you know, creating really, really great country Western uh, or, you know, or even like bluegrass folk, uh, you know, to this day, if, you know, if Conway Twitty were to tour, I don't even, he's not alive, but, you know, if, if he were, you'd get all those fans that remembered him. I, I think the rock and roll is the same way because the connection in the stories of country Western and rock and roll are so similar. The 
the we both tell those stories. I find some you know country artists tell them a lot better than than um, some rock artists, but um, I think that you know a guy like Sturgill Simpson or or um, uh, or Chris uh, Stapleton, you know what they're touching on musically and lyrically, in my opinion, is so similar to what was happening with rock and roll in the '60s and '70s um, with bands like The Who, uh, bands like Led Zeppelin, um, you know. Uh, even Aerosmith in the seventies, um, their early stuff to me, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still so drawn to like rocks and toys in the attic. Those, those two records for me, um, are, are probably the two greatest rock and roll records that I can remember absolutely falling in love with. And when you've got artists like that, that make great music, the fans come along with it and they stay and stick and, and, don't ever want you to quit um, because you've uh, you've affected them. They, I mean, Kiss's effect on me, you know, was life altering. And to this day, I mean, I still I laugh at him when I go see him now because I'm like, yeah, I can't believe you're squeezing yourself into that fucking outfit. But <laughs> but I mean, it's it's still it's so so vivid in my mind. And, and I think that that is what, what rock and roll does to fans like me and why maybe Candlebox has fans like I am to, to Aerosmith and Kiss and, and that sort of thing. They are the same with me or with Candlebox. And, and I think we also, you know, Candlebox was never a sum of its parts. It's always been the whole. And, you know, so it's not like anybody, you know, it's not like I was Eddie Vedder and Pete was, you know, Mike McCready. Or uh, you know Scott Weiland and and um, Slash you know with Velvet Revolver, Candlebox was Candlebox and people loved those songs and they didn't. I mean, there's still people that walk up to my guitar player Brian and say, "Hey, great show, Pete! You're amazing!" Like they don't know he's not Pete. They just assume that he's still in the band, um, and that says something to me about what we've done as a band musically. You know, it's it's it they don't necessarily know who we are. They just love us. And when we come to town, they want to see us play. And, and I love that. I mean, I, I, I don't ever want that to change. And I, I've been trying to quit this band for years now. I mean, I seriously, I'm like, <laughs> I've done interviews. Like, ah, I might, you know, I'm going to turn 50 next year. I'm going to put it away, you know? And then now I'm 51. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, this is my last year. I'm going to take the next couple of years off and maybe in, you know, uh, in, 2022 i'll go out and do you know maybe six weeks with pete and barty and scott just you know to celebrate something you know maybe the, the 30th anniversary of the debut album. i but i can't do it every time you know even now i'm not on the road and i really 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 want to be on the road um i want to be playing shows i and i and i said i wasn't going to feel that way and and here i am not being able to tour and i'm like god if i'd have made this decision last year before all this happened, is this how I would be feeling right now? Because I had just oh, put a candle box away. I'm not going to tour for the next couple of years. Absolutely. That's a, that's a, that's a crazy slap in the face with reality as a musician thinking I can put this away and I won't have a problem with it. And that's not true. I know that when I decide to stop doing music, it's going to be incredibly painful for me, you know? Um, just because of what it's given me as a, as an artist in, a, in my career, you know? Um, but there's going to come a point when this just isn't going to work that way. And I can't go and, you know, hit those notes. And then I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be that guy. Um, you know, uh, I can tell you that when you lose, <clears throat> you know, cause that's how I looked at WAF. I mean, I was yeah. there for 29 years. I was on the air for 22. Yeah. And the day that decision wasn't made, by me, it was made, obviously, when the station got sold. But when you wake up <clears throat> and it's not there anymore, yeah, the emotional pitfall is staggeringly deeper and harder than you can imagine it to be. Oh, sure. It, it was so the first day and I, you know, I got to say COVID has made it. I think a little bit easier for me because the world, <laughs> the world isn't normal. Like, you yeah. know, when you lose someone that you love and you're in your car, you know, 
going from the funeral home to the cemetery yeah. and your 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 soul is gone and you drive by people that are just going about their life yeah. and you're like but but my life is over that person died for me and you're just out there going to the fucking post office and you don't even understand <laughs> Yeah. It was like that for me with AAF. And then when COVID hit, like everybody's lives stopped just like me. So at least I've had that common experience that everyone is kind of trying to figure out what the hell is going on. But yeah, we're but all I sharing can't ever go. Sure. Yeah, but I can't go back to it. No. And and so I wasn't willing, like you're talking about, to just move on and do something else because I loved what I did so much, which is now why I started my company and launched my podcast and are doing everything that I'm doing because like you, I can't quit it yet. Yeah. It's still so ingrained in me that I can't walk away from it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a strange emotion to, yeah. to go through, you know, and, and, and the reality of, of, you know, thinking that at some point I'm, I'm actually going to consciously put this away. Uh, it, it seems alien to me. Even yeah. last year when I was saying it, it seems so normal to say that. But now I'm just like, that's not even going to fucking happen. I mean, am I going to be, am I going to be that guy who is going to be doing this when he's 60 years old? <laughs> Why I not? Mean, it's I, not that far away. And because there's plenty the way I of sing, artists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, listen, I love Robert Plant. We played Kaboo with him, I think it was three years ago, two or three years ago, two years ago. And I love Robert Plant. And I loved his reinterpretations of the Led Zeppelin songs. But there were those moments that I was waiting for that he didn't give us. And, and, and it bummed me out. And I was like, and I know part of him is like, I don't need to do that. But there's a part of him that's going, fuck, I wish I could fucking do that note. You know, because it's... Well, imagine being, you know, yourself trying to compete against Robert yeah. Plant in the heyday of Zeppelin. Like, yeah. yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, that's that's where is that, that's where I'm at when I think about this. I'm like, is that what I'm going to be like? You know, because I don't, I'm just not a normal singer. I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place, you know, and, and, uh, and gymnastics with my voice sometimes, you know. So it's kind of like, at what point am I going to have to call it quits? And then am I going to, you know, am I going to have to start up a radio show or something so that I'm still around that thing that I love? Or do I start a music school or, you know, or do I, you know, start a charter school that's just for the arts or musician, or maybe I go and teach at one of these things. I don't know, man. I'm like, all this shit goes around in my head. I'm a fucking knucklehead, but you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at, you know? And, and it's, and it's strange to think to yourself, if this year hadn't happened, you know, where would, like for you with AF and, and, you know, where would we be? Like, would we be just like it was last year? Would we be just totally normal? And this is, and, and this is like a day to day thing. You know, I mean, I'm, there's part of me that's really kind of like, I think it's amazing that, that this has happened because it's taught me so much about myself. Um, and, and, patience and empathy and you know understanding and and you know all the things that go along with being a good human being um that i i think i had kind of forgotten about you know because my whole life has just been i'm in a touring rock and roll band and this is what i do and you know um that routine is gone and it's it's made me have to take a long hard look at you know me as a person which um is not always easy you know looking in the mirror at yourself and liking yourself um <laughs> not an easy Hard thing, thing to, to do. do sometimes yeah yeah you know so um you know i i i i'm i'm just so i'm so grateful that this has been my career you know and that I, here we are talking about you know music and our lives and i've known you a long long time i, I want to bring up a story before before you have to go <laughs> because it's one of my favorite aaf memories and when you brought up Pete and Barty and Scott, it's all tied back to that original lineup of Candlebox. Do you remember the the trip that we took to the mall? Yeah. When you were touring with Rush? Yeah. yeah. And 
and what you insisted on buying Getty as a gift. Do you rem- can do you remember what it is? Because it's so vivid yeah. in my head that I can remind you the details if you don't remember. But the, I wanted don't. to see if you remember the Jerry Gar- Jerry Garcia Chia pet. Yes, yeah. it was specific, and we had to also get we had to get Neil Pert that right handed catcher's mitt. That's right. Because because he uh, when he throws a stick sometimes he would miss it, but he was so good at grabbing a new stick that people didn't see that he missed it. So we got him that right handed catcher's mitt. But yeah, I remember that very vividly. That was a lot of fun, and you know it was fun for us to 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 not only be with you to do something like that, but you know going on touring with Rush was. I mean, you know, if you're a if you're any kind of rock and roll fan and a, and a musician, that's a dream come true, you know. And I mean, we were when we got asked to do that tour. It was kind of like, are you fucking kidding me? Rush? We're gonna open for Rush? I mean, I told my brother Dennis, he's like, you fucking kidding me? Fucking bullshit. I mean, <laughs> it was like he wanted to kill me because you know I was um, I was going out with his favorite band. I'm like, look, I'm just opening. I'm not in Rush, you know. I'm just opening, but. Yeah, I do remember that. That was a lot of fun. And of course, when we talk about things with 2020, you know, being the Rush fan that you are and having toured with the band and had personal interactions with Neil Peart, can you just talk about him as a person and then obviously growing up loving the drums, his impact on drumming in the whole industry? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. immeasurable, right? Yeah, he, uh, well, I mean, that's one of the first musicians that I uh, tried to emulate when I started playing drums was I wanted to. I wanted to play like him. Um, so, you know, being able to, to tour with him and get to know him and have him come into our dressing room and talk to us about the show. Tonight's show, I, I didn't really like that set list. You know, I think like in Austin, he, he, we had done like, I think five or six shows with him and he came into our dressing room after the Austin show. And he said, so tomorrow in San Antonio, um, I think we should, I think you guys should try starting the set list like this. He's like, I've been watching the shows and I think it would flow better. If, and we're like, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> like, uh, why? You're Neil Pert. Why are you paying attention to what we're doing? But he was right, and that's how amazing not only he was, but the entire band. I mean, they were really the kindest, most uh, generous and gracious human beings that uh, we've ever toured with. I mean, you know, Metallica were amazing, great guys, but they're, the the guys in Rush were phenomenal human beings and Neil was just the kindest soul. I was just heartbroken when, when I heard about his wife and his daughter and kind of all that stuff, you know, years later after we toured with him, because he wasn't that person. He wasn't that quiet person. He was a very, very, you know, lovely, lovely person to be around. I played 18 holes of golf with him in their end of tour party uh, in a golf cart. But we talked to, you know, I said, listen, when I was a kid, I used to try this stuff, you know, and that's how I learned to play drums. He's like, you were trying to play, my drum parts when you were 10 years old. I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, but I was, I mean, you know, and, and I, I go, I can't believe I'm sitting here with you. You know, I, it's, it's just, I go, it's just the greatest gift that, that you gave me as a young child, um, the love of music and how much I wanted to play like you, you know? And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm so sad that, that he passed this uh, past year, you know, but, um, remarkable musician. I mean, just, you know, and not and what a lyricist, you know, he wrote all the fucking lyrics. Yeah. That's crazy. Not That's, that's not the common thing for mm-hmm. the drummer to be the one writing no. the lyrics at no. all. And then to be able to be back there doing astrophysics <laughs> behind a drum set. <laughs> yeah, fully. I mean, it was a, to watch him every single night was fucking mind blowing. Like how, did, how did you even get there from there when he would do something? It was just, Amazing. Um, I'm so glad you remember that trip to the, we went to the Greendale (laughs) Mall. I'm so glad because I've told the story so many times and people are like, Getty Lee collected Chia Pets. And I'm like, look, I took the guys from Candlebox in my car to the goddamn mall to buy him the Chia Pet. I'm telling you, this is true. If you look up old videos of them from 94, you will see that he had Chia Pets all over his base. Like, you you know, every year he changed it. Like the one year he had washing machines, you know, on stage. Uh, but the reason we got him the Jerry Garcia one is he hated the Grateful Dead. <laughs> so we, and he was like, when he opened, he's like, you can't be serious. And we're like, you have to, <laughs> you have to grow it. It's a Chia pet. You have to grow it. You don't have to love it, but you have to grow. It. I mean, he was just like, you guys are insane. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's why we did it because he hated the Grateful Dead. And, but he, that, that whole stage was just his whole side of the stage was Chia pets. 
it's such a fond memory. And, yeah. you know, when I, when I, when I write the book someday, you know, of, of my life in rock and roll and that story <laughs> is definitely, it's just the most random, yeah. you know, what, what did you do? Well, I took candle box to the mall to buy chia pets for Getty Lee. Like what, what the fuck? Like, yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. And these were all the kind of stories that the last week that AAF was on the air, it was all these little stories that you were like, oh my God, wait a minute. What about this time and that time? And uh, we just didn't have enough time to go through them all in that last week that we were on the air. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I love the fact that there's so many artists that have been coming on the podcast, not only to talk about those old times, but also... You know, there's so many artists that I've asked to be on the podcast and they're like, well, I don't have a record coming out. I don't have anything to talk about. And I'm like, do you not know that everybody still loves you just because yeah. of COVID and you're not touring? We all still want to hear how you're doing. It's we want to know what's going on with yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Conversation is beautiful. Yeah. And, and when you talk to people and you have a shared love of anything, like you and I have a shared love of music and all of the bands that you've been talking about, it's, it helps. Don't you feel like it, 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 that's why I wanted to use this service so that you and I could see each other Yeah. because it, it makes me feel like I'm a social part of the world again, which, yeah. you know, I'm lacking that a lot of the time, locked in MCHQ, <laughs> editing audio by myself. It's, yeah. I went from a super, um, social life, you know, constantly being at shows and doing radio promotions to kind of being locked in the studio and so at least you know yeah i can see you when we talk and it's nice to reconnect and tell old stories and you know and the fact that you're still doing it and got this new music that's out there and um you know it's what's needed right now the fans need the distraction we need the the new music and we need the hope that the tours will come yeah because that's what's going to help us get through the rest of the craziness i think yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And we're, we're, you know, we're in the same boat you know, as the fans because um, we're fans of, of touring. You know, we're fans of theirs. Thank you for coming to the shows. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, a big fan of you fans of Candlebox, you know, and and, um, and we're all we're all just trying to stay a little bit sane, you know. And we're going to do it together, especially as a rock community, even though the rock stations <clears throat> are going away and even though it's becoming harder. Yeah. The great thing about rock and roll is that it's scrappy and it always finds a way. And all of this new technology is affording us the ability to find a new way. Yeah. And if the rock community has to go back underground from where it started and go into podcasting and go into dirty clubs, then that's what we're going to do because that's what needs to happen to keep us all together. Uh, you're, you're 100% right. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it is. And as a community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin, it was so great to see you. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time. And oh, my pleasure. I'm so glad that, you know, you're still creating music that you didn't decide to hang it up last year, like you were thinking. <laughs> and, and Well, I did. Uh, I hung it up. I, you know, I hung it up last year. Said I was going to take this year off and here I am. Yeah. And here you are. You failed at quitting. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. Well, it was it was great to see you and I you just too. want to put this invite out there. Um I host a video show every Tuesday night um that's live. It's streamed called Cocktails in the War Room. Mm -hmm. And um it's a room in my house that I call the War Room and it's where the bar is. And that was what spearheaded me to start my company in the podcast is that I just started going live on my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And so every Tuesday night at 8:30 thousands of us rock fans in new england get together for a cocktail in the war room and i can bring you in via skype so i'm officially inviting you to join us for a cocktail in the war room or a mocktail if you don't drink anymore because we do mocktails in the war room too <laughs> no I'm, and, I'm a drinker. Um, okay I, I wasn't sure but like brad arnold last week we were talking about you know he doesn't drink anymore i was like well, then we'll make it mocktails for you brad just come and hang out with us in the war room so yeah. you know if you're ever sitting around and you want to have a drink with us we can make that happen and I I know everybody in the war room would love to have you and it's yeah. super interactive and live and they can ask questions and it's really fun. I would love to do that. I'd be honored. All right. Awesome. I'm going to take you up on that. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. You too. It's great to see your face. Hang it's in there. great to see you too. You too. And um, like I said, you know, as soon as the band gets back out on the road again, you know, the, the between the decision for the tour and me calling for free tickets, it's in there somewhere. So <laughs> just expect the phone call. <laughs> Not a problem. I got you. All right. I'll talk to you soon, Kevin. It was great to see you.
smell good. Yeah, Warm right. up those pipes. I'm back home in LA too. I'm not back. I'm not in Palm Springs anymore, so I'm a little bummed. <laughs> oh, really? How is the air? It's where we live. We live in Beverly Hills, um, so like Benedict Canyon area. Um, so it's not bad. Um, it's really just that valley side of of you know that that oh, kind of whole okay. basin over there is just full of smoke and you know. Everybody I know that's out in that part of the country is just like the air quality is so bad right now yeah, because of the yeah, fires. Yeah, really. It just kind of depends on what where where you're at in LA. You know, it's uh, but it just yeah. we we choose to live here. It's what we get. Yeah. Well, you know, talk to me in January when I got three feet of snow. <laughs> no, I don't miss I that. That's 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 why when you choose to live here, you yeah. got to kind of put up with it, right? So, Kevin, we had this great conversation the other day. And it was so great catching up with you. And as soon as we said goodbye, I went and got a coffee and came back to my computer and saw the news that Eddie Van Halen had passed away. And there are so few pillars in rock and roll. And when we lose one, it shakes the foundation. And we lost one in Eddie Van Halen. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you could get... There's no, there was no greater innovator of, of guitar. You know, I mean, every single one of the greats has innovated something or created something, you know, whether it was Hendrix, you know, sliding his guitar on the uh, microphone stands or, uh, you know, the way he would um, patch together his amps or something like that. Of course, Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, you know, the, the list of, of innovative guitar, but Robert Johnson, guys like, you know, the Blues Cats, the list goes on and on. But the, I don't think that anybody, ever created the type of guitar playing prior to Eddie Van Halen that, that he created. Um, and to watch him do it live, you know, I saw Van Halen, I don't know, three or four times back in the um, late eighties and, uh, and early and mid nineties. Um, it just seemed like he never really, you know, lost anything. I was lucky enough to play golf with him. I think it was like 1999. Um, my manager at the Times uh, associate uh, um, was Mike Poole was doing all of Eddie Van Halen's kind of solo stuff. Mike Poole is like a producer, engineer. He wrote uh, Hill Street Blues and stuff like that. Uh, his son, Aaron, was was my manager's assistant and said, hey, I'm going to go play golf with my dad and Eddie today. You want to go? And I, was, I didn't know who he meant, Eddie. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. I'd, I'd love that. And, you know, it's this beautiful course here in the valley. It's called Lakeside. And um it's private um, and, you know, pull up. It's like 6.37 in the morning and we're just getting our, our carts ready. And Eddie comes flying up in one of his Ferraris and, you know, pulls the cart or the, the, the uh, golf bags out of the back, throws them on the cart and then puts a 24 pack in the cooler. And uh, I said to Aaron, I was like, I thought you said Eddie was sober. And he's like, that to Eddie is sober because it's Bud Light, you know. Um, it was just, he was one of those guys that we played 18 holes and he finished 24 beers, uh, you know, over 18 holes. And he actually talked to me a bit about, you know, Candlebox and would I be ever interested in doing something with him? It was after, of course, the Gary Sharon kind of debacle, um, the, the mistake they think that the band had made. Not that those weren't good songs. It just, it wasn't the right fit, you know. Um, it's already hard enough to replace a lead yeah, singer once yeah. in a band, trying to do it twice and maintaining the level of success that Van Halen had achieved not yeah. once, but twice with lead singers. And, you know, Gary here in Massachusetts is yeah. a, is a rock yeah. God to all of us. And, you know, we were excited on one hand that he was getting this opportunity to be in Van Halen. And then at the other <laughs> hand, you know, the bar set so high, not only by David Lee Roth, but then to have Sammy Hagar come in and almost reinvent the yeah. sound of the band and have an equal amount of success in that right that's yeah. a really hard thing for somebody like Gary Sharon to try. And, and Eddie actually into. discussed that with me. He's like, you know, it, it was one of the conversations they had had early on. You know, he said, he said it was very magical working with him. Like it was the same with Sammy. Like they just sat down. It was, it was just um, they they were in synchronicity in their their style of writing and their songwriting and and what they wanted to do. Uh, he felt that he had that um, syncretic relationship with Gary, but that it just they they missed the the point when they went to record it is is kind of how he explained it to me and that you know he and Gary had discussed it earlier Gary's like look I'm not really sure I want to step in these shoes and you know um it, it's it's uh you know quite um, 
quite an honor to to you know kind of even discuss something like that with Eddie, um, you know, being a lead singer. So I, when Eddie mentioned to me, "Hey, would you ever be interested in doing something?" You know, immediately you're like, "Yeah, dude, just call. Um, I'm happy to come jam with you." But um, it, that never happened. But you know, I mean, I, at least I have that one moment. You know, four and a half hours of playing golf with one of the greatest guitar players ever, and really, I mean, just it, it was a shocker. We were just we were actually, you know, when 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 it happened, I was just sitting by the pool with Adam, my bass player. And he's like, no. And I'm like, what? And he goes, dude, Eddie Van Halen. I was like, ah, it finally caught him. Cause I had spoken to Aaron in um, like January, February. And he mentioned that Eddie was in just in really bad shape. Uh, so I wasn't really shocked. I just, I'm saddened, you know I mean? Unfortunately, you know, of course, someone of, of that great talent to, to be taken down by, you know, something as stupid as cancer. Um, you know, that, that, it's just such a fucking awful disease. You don't wish it on anyone. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss that guy's playing, you know, um, really. I, and I, I hope that if there's anything good that comes of this, it's that, that kids that are trying to play guitar now, remember how important a guitar solo is in rock and roll music. You know, if you're, if you're pushing yourself right now to be that, if the next Eddie Van Halen, you're doing the right thing. Cause, and if you can surpass him, um, you know, please do, because um, he was one of the greats that will be forgotten for, or will, will no time soon. I mean, thousands of years, people will talk about Eddie Van Halen. What kind of a golfer was he? Was he, He's good. Was he a guy that took it seriously a, a scholar of the sport or was he <laughs> or, or like did he try really hard or is it something that he was just doing as a social outlet to kind of get together with people he liked and be outside um he was kind of natural um he could play the game i don't think it was something that he you know was going to do every single day um i think that day he shot maybe like a 90 or something so he, he had a he had a relatively comfortable swing he, um I remember he was, um, it just joked the whole time. He'd be talking in his backswing, you know, when he was, you know, getting ready to drive the ball. It's just one of those characters, you know, that um, I think don't, I don't think he took anything but music seriously, really. I, I think he just was that kind of sports were something that he did for the hell of it. I know he raced cars a lot um, around, you know, the canyons up here. He had a couple really fast Ferraris um, uh, that he would run around his Mike and, you know, his buddy Mike, and they would, chase these things, chase one another through the canyons. But music, I think, was really his only real spirit. Was the, sorry, it was the only thing that he really took that seriously. I love the fact that he threw his golf clubs in a Ferrari. I don't even yeah. know where you put golf clubs in a Ferrari. In the passenger seat? Where <laughs> yeah, else do they in, fit? They were in the passenger seat. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one of the very few times that I met him, he was on tour with Sammy in the early 2000s. And the guys from Shinedown were opening up for the band. And Brent, the singer, had asked if I wanted to go say hi to Eddie. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course. I think we were in Denver. And I remember going in, and he obviously, at that point, you could tell, had been struggling. And um, I remember sitting there, and it was just him and Wolfgang and me and Brent. And I was fascinated by his hands. Mm -hmm. Because his hands, you know, they had those big knuckles. And it was almost yep. like his fingertips were almost bigger than the rest of the finger, like those frogs, you yep. know, that... that use their yep. fingertips to kind of stick to the side of a wall. And I remember the whole time I was sitting in there looking at his hands, wondering how he played the way that he played with those hands, because they didn't seem like these delicate. thin, <laughs> delicate, slender, agile fingers that would be required for the kind of playing that he did. Yeah. And then I remember watching the show and going, oh my God, he's doing yeah. that with those big kind of off-shaped fingers that you wouldn't think would be able to just sail up and down a guitar neck like that. Yeah. I think that's one of the things, um, that, uh, a lot of musicians would talk about with him, but you know, he was such a, you know, playing with metal picks and, you know, and stuff like that. Um, that's part of the reason that he designed his guitars the way he did with the, the string, uh, the string, I think it's the, um, the width of, of each string on the, on the neck and, and, the the um, 
the dimensions of everything that happened within that neck was for those movements of his fingers. And that's why he, you know, if you were like, let's say Peter Klett, our original guitar player, was to go play Eddie Van Halen's rig on Eddie's guitar, it wouldn't sound anything like Eddie Van Halen. Even if it was the same, you know, it, it literally you turn Eddie's rig on, go stand and play it, it wouldn't sound like it because he just, it was the way his fingers and the calluses and, and those knuckles, you know, like they were, like you said, they were kind of like monstrous and it looked like, you know, he had rheumatoid arthritis or something, but it was those, the density of his fingers and, and, and kind of the grip that which he had is what gave him all that tone. And, and, um, yeah, it's funny it, now that you mentioned that, like to, to actually remember watching him playing, thinking the same thing is like, man, his fingers just seem kind of monstrous to be playing something so gracefully. Um, but you know, that's, I guess probably when he started out at such a young age, um, it, it's it's how he created his tone. I mean, that's you know everybody says that the great guitar players, it's not their amps, the guitar, or the, you know, or the, um, you know, whether it's a Les Paul or a Fender, it's it's their fingers. You know, the tone is in their hand, and and I firmly believe that. You know, everybody from Jerry Cantrell, you know, the Seattle scene, Mike McCready, Jerry Cantrell, Peter Klett, um, Kim Thale, Chris Cornell, um, you know, all those musicians, they were able to to do something with their fingers that you know, other guitar players can't, you know, it's just, uh, that, that tone is in their hands. I mean, I play guitar and I, you know, I don't even know, I don't have a tone. Um, <laughs> my, my fingers are tone deaf. But, well, your um, voice does though. You're one of those lead singers works. that, that is, that is lucky enough to have a very distinctive sound. When you hear uh, you, you, you know who you are. Thanks. And I totally understand what you're talking about with guitar players. A couple months ago on the podcast, I did something a little different. We did a guitar player like round table and it was Mark Morton from Lamb of God, Doc Coyle from Bad Wolves, and Chris Trainer from Bush. And I really wanted to get these three guys from kind of three different styles of music, and they didn't even all know each other at the time, but to talk about the art of guitar playing and the art of constructing a song. And, and, and they said, all three of them, exactly what you were just talking about, that you could have someone go up with Jimmy Page's guitar and Jimmy Page's rig in the exact same room where he just played and do everything the exact same, and you could not replicate what he sounded like in that moment. And it's exactly the same thing that you're talking about here, and that is the artistry of the actual player. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. It's it's, And that's why Eddie was so special, because he was, he was you know, they they joked that he was you know the Wolfgang uh, you know Mozart Amadeus uh, of of rock and roll you know this is guy who who you know these five you know ten little things um, created these amazing orchestras and and um, concertos and I mean you know you listen to like little guitars like what he's doing on acoustic and. I mean, it's fascinating when you listen to Van Halen to think that that's one guy playing that one part. It's not overdubbed, like, you know, little guitars. Like I'm saying, dum, 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 dum. That's all happening while his pinky's doing that. Blah, 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 blah. Like it's, it's insane that that could happen that way. And I mean, that's not to say that there aren't other musicians in, you know, Brazil and South America and Portugal that do the same thing. But Eddie Van Halen was a virtuoso of every single type of guitar playing there was and he taught himself he couldn't read music so he he watched his teacher when he was young to to learn the song and then he played the song exactly the same so this is somebody who who was so artistically brilliant um on so many levels musically he was destined for success um and destined to change the world and he certainly did and you know he um guy is going to be missed for a really, really long time. You know, um, it's shocking. You know, it's shocking to think that, that this person's not going to be playing music anymore. You know, I think there's people that are spoiled, especially growing up in, in this day and age with technology, that you get spoiled by the fact that with a computer and with all the effects that you have, that you can basically make anything be anything now. But the fact that he was doing that back then yeah, when none of it had ever been done before with very, I mean, literally building his own guitars mm -hmm. um, 
to make these noises and to find a way to do it with this analog equipment that, I mean, nowadays you, you could sound like Eddie Van Halen, but it would take Pro Tools to do it. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy the EVH pedals and all that stuff, but really, he you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, again, the great innovator, um, somebody who took, you know, with limited funding at a very young age, um, because I believe the family was not wealthy at all. I think they were very, very poor when they first came to the to America. So, you know, he he was able to to create this tone with with next to nothing. That's why it's like when you see guitar players that have you know, pedal boards that are like 50 feet long and stuff, you kind of chuckle because, you know, unless you're, um, the, you know, what it, Matt Bellamy from Muse, you don't really need all that stuff to create your tone. You know, you can, you should maybe have four or five pedals to be able to do it. Um, Eddie did it with one pedal, one guitar and one amp, you know, and, um, and that first Van Halen record is uh, mind bendingly um, vicious guitar tones. And, um, and there's such beauty in, in, um, in that first album and just knowing when you first heard, I remember I was, let's see, I would have been about seven or eight years old when that record came out. Um, I remember thinking to myself, wow, what is this, what is this that I'm hearing and what's going to become of this? Like every record after that, I was excited for my older brother, Dennis, um, uh, had, had turned me on to it. And, um, uh, it was like, for me, it was like the first time I heard, uh, Black Sabbath Paranoid. I, I knew that it was I was going to forever be in love with that band, and it was the same thing with Van Halen. Was it? You know, I love David Lee Roth voice. You know, I've I've tried to emulate him on on you know several songs that Candlebox has done over the years. He's one of my favorite singers, and the song Fire on the first record um, is probably hands down my favorite uh, Van Halen song of all time, simply because of the way David sings off of Eddie's playing. It's not David alone. It's it's Eddie owned that song for me, and it was what David was able to do against Eddie's patterns and and rhythms and and structure of the song. That that just to this day, um, there's not a, a week that doesn't go by that I don't listen to that first record. I mean, I I that's a lie. I mean, I would say it's probably like at least once a month I listen to Van Halen one, you know, because it's just that was my childhood and. But again, I own every single record, even the Sammy stuff. You know, I don't own the Gary Sharon one. Wasn't a fan of that record. Uh, but I do I do own every single Van Halen record that um, outside of that one because I just, they were always doing something different, but it was always about Eddie's playing. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not a guitar player, but I was so drawn into what he could do. Um, you know, the whole drill thing, you know, putting the drill next to the pickup when that, when that happened, when I think it was Pound Cake. You know, and that's just the you know the pickup, uh, you know, microphoning the the drill. I mean, who would have thought to do that? I don't know if anybody would have thought to do that. Well, he anymore. made he made that accessible to non guitar players with yep. his delivery. He could have very easily been the stuck up snob, you know, that was like, I'm the scientist up here, just watch me play, and the music could yep. have sounded the same. But the joy that came out of him on stage as a member of Van Halen in those live performances, the smile that was always there, the running around, the jumping, he made that kind of level guitar playing accessible to someone like me that has no musical ability whatsoever. Yeah. But but it made it fun to be that good. Yeah, yeah, it did. And, and you wanted to, you, it's almost as though you wanted to be in, in his world all the time when yeah. you watch him play live. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, listen, he could be, you know, he could be, we've all heard the stories. He could be a real asshole, you know? Um, but you expect that from musicians that of that caliber, you know, that kind of have expectations of, of the people that they play with and the musicians that they're surrounding themselves with. But, um, you know, that's, we're all that way. I think most musicians have those moments where we're, you know, we're like, listen, it's my way or the highway. If you don't fucking like it, there's the door. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's not to discount um, how incredibly um, generous and kind he was uh, on so many levels, like you mentioned. And he did make it accessible once he finally turned around and let everybody see what he was doing with his fingers. Um, you know, it was all of a sudden a whole new breed of musicians came about. And, you know, I don't know, um, 
you know, some would argue that Ingve Malmsteen, you know, maybe um, took it to another level with um, Eddie's style of playing. I am, I'm not a big Ingve fan, um, but um, certainly I think Eddie's influence was felt across the board from 1976 till, um, you know, Wednesday, the, the whatever the seventh of of, uh, of October, you know, twenty twenty. There's also, and and if you could comment on this as a songwriter, there's also an art when you talk about Eddie versus, say, Ingve. There's a certain art to writing a song that is accessible and and more of a pop song, which I think Van Halen, even though the style and the 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 the, the artistry in the play was so complex, they were still able to just write a great rock song that everyone wanted to rock out to. And maybe that's kind of the disparity with Ingve is that it never could get boiled down into something that just ended up being the soundtrack at a great keg party. Yeah. I mean, Ingve's, you know, Ingve's a me, me, me guy. And, um, you know, look at me, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Eddie, Eddie could write, I mean, I remember when 1984 came out and everybody heard that keyboard at the beginning of it. Everybody was just like, what the hell is this? Van Halen with keyboards, you know? And then you realize it's actually Eddie playing it and and it's 1984 and he's taken a, 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 what would be considered like, you know, new wave instrument, British pop, and putting it in a rock song and making it sound really fucking amazing and beautiful. And... um I mean, he, he, the way he crafted songs, um, you know, you like Unchained is another one of my favorite um, Van Halen songs. I'm, I'm probably everybody in the world's favorites, but um, the, the structure of that song is not so different than the structure of 1984, but the, the progressions and the movements and the changes uh, in his playing um, so like with 1984 and in a lot of the Van Halen stuff, you've just got a pedal bass line, right? It's just a da 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 It's not really going anywhere. But that allows for everything else around it to move. And, and it supports the drums in a strange way because it's just like a constant on a kick drum. And it's one of the things that Eddie, I think, did very early on in his career was to establish that this is a pop song in a sense that – we're not making a lot of movement, a lot of melody around the foundation of the song. We're, we're making a movement in the melody with the vocal and the guitar and creating this kind of uh, painting that um, it, rather than you know being splattered full of stuff, it, it was very distinct and, um, uh, and directed in its brush strokes. And I think that that's why when Sammy Hagar came along that the band stepped it up a whole other level because Sammy's very similar in, in his songwriting and the way that he would approach things where the simplistic approach of the drum and bass allowed for Sammy's vocals and his guitar playing to take that song to a, a whole other level in a pop sensibility, um, which nowadays it would be, you know, maybe a synthesizer pattern, a synthesizer, synthesizer, <laughs> <laughs> synthesizer, <laughs> synthesizer pattern or synthesized instrument to carry that kind of direction. And then you have like a vocal and maybe, um, you know, some sort of other synthesizer pattern over the top of it that creates that palette. And, you know, Eddie was doing it, I think late seventies and, uh, and, you know, and early on in the eighties with, with kind of creating what he was coming up with for 1984. And then, you know, God, all those records with Sammy later. And it was just, that, that it seemed like synthesizer was like the foundation of everything that they were doing for those, those um, last few Van Halen records. And it shows the importance of Alex and Michael Anthony in that the sound and the complexity of somebody like Eddie or those vocals wouldn't have been possible, like you said, without that, that foundation. And so while you might listen to it and say, oh, well, Van Halen's never been a big bass-focused band or a big drum-focused band, their importance is just as on par as everything else because if they weren't there then eddie and sammy or eddie and david would not have been able to kind of do the calisthenics around it all yeah that they yeah. did that that their roles in that band were just as important just different well it's you know that, that a lot you you can use the example in in the world of art where you say anybody can paint on a white canvas um try painting on a black canvas 
and creating something from that. It's an entirely different thing. And I, and I, I use that example with this, where it's it, without that, that foundation of that drum and that bass being as simple black as it could be, all this color was able to be put on top of that. Whereas if it's a white canvas, the color doesn't really bounce as much. It doesn't pop out as much. And, and so my example is that, you know, Alex and, and, and um, Michael just had this, they painted this amazingly beautiful black canvas that Eddie and David were so able to, and of course, Sammy as well, to, to shine on um, and, and, and let those, those colors of their styles really pop out. And, um, and it's, it was a, an amazing band. And I, you know, I, I, I'm so sorry for Wolfgang and, and Alex and those guys, you know, the whole band and everybody that's ever worked with them because um, they must be just feeling enormous um, uh, sorrow and sadness right now because he was, um, you know, just, I'm sure to them, probably just the greatest gift from God ever. And, and um, you know, it's just a sad, sad, sad day indeed to lose somebody that, that uh, was that talented. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's on par with, you know, Bowie and, and Prince and, um, you know, all Chris and all the greats that we've lost over the, over the years. Um, it just, uh, you know, in a different way, Eddie just was just the great innovator and, um, it's going to be strange not to, to see him play ever again. It made me really happy to hear that Sammy and he had reconnected, yeah. um, even though they did it secretly to not fuel the reunion rumors. Yeah. But it just made me really happy to know that, that they were able to kind of get back together again and, and for, for Sammy to have that closure now moving forward. Mm. You know? I hope Michael was able to do that. I, you know, I haven't heard anything from Michael about that. I know that, um, they had a really rough falling out as well. And, and, um, you know, like I said, Eddie could be, you know, he could be a very jealous person and did not like people doing things outside of uh, his world, you know, from, from, you know, my relationship to people that knew him. Um, and, uh, and he was very easy. It was very easy for him to cut people out of his life. So, um, I, I was happy to hear that Sammy was able to kind of find a way back in there as well. And I hope that him and Dimebag are are shredding on those two guitars, knowing that Eddie Van Halen had placed that black and yellow guitar in the grave yeah. with Dimebag, and then yeah. to know that you know those guys are hopefully jamming the shit out of some guitars right now would be nice to know. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a hell of a show to be watching. Yeah, right. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate you jumping back on with me. Um, I I was so happy when you and I finished talking and then within an hour was shattered at this news. And I knew that you would bring great perspective on <laughs> it. Well, no, cause I know what a, what a scholar of the art of songwriting you are. I've known mm. you long enough to know that, you know, you'd be able to kind of speak eloquently about the songwriting process and how Van Halen inspired you as a musician. I had no idea that you played 18 holes of golf with Eddie Van Halen with his yeah. golf clubs in the passenger seat of a Ferrari. <laughs> That's friggin' aw It's like the most Van Halen thing ever. Yeah, yeah. And I love that visual, too. So what color was it, by the way? Was it red, the Ferrari? Oh, geez, I don't know. Red or yellow? I can't remember. It was... It was um... You know you're Eddie Van Halen when there's so many Ferraris, people can't keep track of. Yeah, color well, I know, I know he had, I know he had several. I think yeah. it was, um, I think it was like the, I think it was the red 305 GT uh, convertible. Like, I can't remember um, or the 302. It's got to be the convertible to fit the golf clubs in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's true. No, I think it was, I recall it being red, but I know he had a, I know he had a yellow one at the same time. I just. I think it was just the shock of him getting out of the car and pulling golf clubs out of it. I can't really remember the Yeah, color, they could but... have given you a heads up when they said we're playing golf with Eddie that that like they, <laughs> Well, I think Aaron just could assumed have just because said Eddie Van Halen. I mean I, it... but I think Aaron just assumed because he was working with Eddie and so was his father that I would just assume he meant Eddie Van Halen. So right. um but, I have a yeah. buddy named Eddie and I don't assume whenever anyone says his name that it's Eddie Van Halen. Like <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was great to see you. Thank you so yeah. much for jumping back on. And My pleasure. Uh, I will talk to you soon, I hope. All right, doll. All right, we'll see you later. Well, if that doesn't make you want to play golf with Kevin Martin from Candlebox, I don't know what does. I mean, the guy basically plays golf with rock and roll royalty and legends. And I'm glad he remembered the Chia Pet. If you liked what you heard, 
Uh, share it with all your Candlebox friends. Subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss anything, including the sit reps, Monday through Friday. All your music headlines, all your rock updates, everything you need to know in less than five minutes. And last night, we celebrated episode 100 of Cocktails in the War Room. So if you haven't joined the War Room family every Tuesday night at 8.30 live on my Facebook page, you can join us. Also, you can find me on Patreon, get yourself a Mistress Carrie backstage pass. And I am having a blast making Cameo videos for you. So if I can make a custom video for anything, just go to Cameo.com slash Mistress Carrie. Huge thanks to Latini Creative Solutions at latinicreative.com and the Main Hair Lounge at mainhairlounge.com for sponsoring this week's episode. All of the links that you could possibly need for this episode, all my social media outlets, all of Kevin Martin's and Candlebox, and the exclusive playlist for this episode are all in the description. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wilde, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.